Welcome everybody to today's uh, topic on transgenerational trauma. My name is Daria Haitoglo. I'm a psychologist and a director of Virginia Satir Institute in the UK, in London. And today uh, we're going to be discussing a very interesting topic. Actually, that's dear to my heart because I spend a lot of my professional hours dealing with clients who suffer from transgenerational trauma and I run retreats and workshops around the world. Currently, I'm in Greece and we run retreats in Greece on how to heal from transgenerational trauma. And we gather uh, groups of uh, 30, 40 people from around the world, not necessarily all suffering from trauma, but a lot of them are. And uh, they're all from different walks of life, different uh, backgrounds and age and gender uh, spectrum and uh, different preferences in life and different also traumatic experiences. So I come uh, to this topic with a lot of professional experience, but also personal experience, because I also have transgenerational trauma that I worked through and I have been working. So let's say it's never a finished business. It's always a work in progress. And uh, my journey started very early on when I was 14 and I started learning more about psychology and participated in kind of this uh, format that workshops with a psychologist. And it really got me thinking and triggered my curiosity, triggered my interest in why we do what we do. How does the um, pattern in our family travel through generation and why? And you know, I had some mental health issues in my family and some uh, issues in relationships in previous generations. And up until I had my own family, I never experienced it. But suddenly when I had my uh, family created with children and uh, my partner, I started experiencing very interesting um, triggers that I didn't feel personally connected to. But then I found out my grandmothers and great grandfathers had that kind of issue. So it got me also curious. And I looked into that area and found uh, a few teachers, mentors, supervisors who uh, focus on uh, transgenerational trauma and stress and studied with Bert Hellinger in Germany, in Austria, and also Virginia Satir. And since then I um, direct her uh, institute and we offer trainings in uh, the Satir model. So a lot of the material today will be based on the Satir growth model that uh, takes an interesting um, uh, Luca Satir was the pioneer in family systems in, and she was the uh, so-called mother of family therapy. So a lot of this is based and founded in the systemic uh, family model. Anyway, let's get going. So why are we here? First of all, I would like to share um, a few um, you know, uh, notes about trauma and why and how it travels through generations. Uh, we, I would like to uh, all of us to better understand and also learn how to support individuals and their families who have gone through uh, transgenerational trauma, but also have an insightful experience, a personal insight through today's uh, presentation and workshop. So buckle your seat belts. Hopefully you get a nice uh, cup of tea or herbal tea or maybe even coffee if it's in the morning and uh, wherever you are just listen to my voice but also I hope you can see the slides because some of them are quite visual and informative and I look forward to hearing uh, from you if you have any questions at the end of it. So what is trauma? Trauma is uh, an exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence, but also it's not necessarily just an exposure that makes a difference. It's um, the response or uh, reaction, I would say, to that exposure, because some people experience trauma, but they don't get traumatized. Uh, and some people who got traumatized will develop certain mental health issues and conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder. And actually based on the general statistics around the world, we know that one in two people 
would have experienced at least one traumatic event during their lifetime. And one in five who experienced trauma would develop PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, it's around 20%. Now, what is transgenerational trauma? When an individual has a trauma response to a trauma experienced by a family member in a previous generation, we call it transgenerational trauma or intergenerational trauma, multi-generational trauma, inherited family trauma, or hereditary trauma, different names for the same thing. But what it means is that there is some issue or pattern, I would say. It's not necessarily always a problem, a trauma that is bad, because we also have some experiences in the past that travel through generations that are very good, and they make us also very resilient. So it's not just all negative, it's actually quite a potent uh, mix. It's kind of like, um, you know, a baton that every generation passes to the next generation. And sometimes that but on skips one or two generations and appears uh, mysterious, mystically, mysteriously, you know, out of the blue, surprisingly, in some parts of our life that we don't expect. But there is interesting, of course, a range of symptoms of transgenerational trauma, as you can see here on the slide. Uh, and it all can be... Um, quite subtle, like uh, perfectionism, for example, or uh, hypervigilance, maybe a sleep issue or some sort of school problem if it's a child, or maybe um, there's a, a level of anxiety or emotional sensitivity, relationship problem, behavior problem, or any sorts of, you know, already serious uh, issues like depression, phobia, panic attack, self-harming, of course, suicidal thoughts, uh, domestic violence, eating disorders, um, attachment issues, substance abuse, you name it. I mean, transgenerational trauma is just a huge umbrella of breadth and depth of different issues that we can look into. The good news is that there's always an opportunity to change the way we are, and there's a way to heal forward, but also to heal backward. And it's very interesting. When I did my personal work, uh, I did a family reconstruction according to Satya model. And uh, my parents and grandparents didn't know about me doing the workshop. But interestingly, my relationship with them changed. And their lives, according to their, of course, self-report, changed somehow connected to that event. And I was very curious um, to, uh, to see if it was just me personally, that's how I got into this field. But what I hear again and again is that this work also helps previous generations somehow. We don't know how in science, we don't know. This is still a mysterious phenomenon. We're still researching it, but there's maybe some in inclination, indication, maybe speculation, hypothesis, but let's say we don't know how uh, it happens. Uh, some books have written, been written about quantum um, phenomenology by Robert Sheldrake, for example, about the science of life, uh, how we are connected through this invisible memory, in, invisible uh, form of um, DNA formation. And we can talk a little bit about what the science and uh, neuroception, neurogenesis, uh, and neuroscience says about it, but a lot of it is still in. Um, the infant stage of the research, let's say. I picked some uh, interesting uh, visual representation of this topic from the wild, call it wild, uh, world web, uh, not the wide um, world web, because there are so many people now interested in this topic. And here we have um, a visual representation when where it shows the mater maternal material, uh, maternal line trauma, so from the mother, and also paternal line trauma, and interception uh, of the ancestral trauma, sort of the previous generation. So what it creates uh, through, let's say, the factors, the stress factors like environmental uh, toxicity, for example, could be a collective crisis or uncertainty, nutrition and air pollution. Ancestral history, culture, fear, uh, epigenetic adaptation, fear structures, the recent life events, separations, stresses, explicit or subtle abuse, and the the 
the areas that these uh, big elements uh, connect and intercept each other, we have in uterus stress, the birth trauma, big, big topic, and identity formation and belief systems. So all that, these kind of like big platforms that influence whether and how and what sort and kind of the symptoms and you know the way how we um, form in our body, mind, and you know on all levels that residue, that blueprint of the trauma, transgenerational trauma. Now another uh, visual I I saw on Instagram I liked it. The description of intergenerational trauma from uh, you know three different let's say case studies of Jane, Ashanti, and Ashok. Uh, Jane, for example, comes from uh, Europe and she has ancestors who survived European wars. And of course, through her DNA structure, um, there was you know, trauma passed through uh, the generations, through her great, great grandparents. And there are elements of PTSD, alcoholism, sexual abuse, and emotional repression that all influence her, but not just her, um, also her family, her immediate family members. Um, Ashanti, for example, has um, a history of her family in American South and the slavery and racial violence. Um, so Ashanti's great great grandparents experienced trauma through the um, you know abandonment, domestic violence, low self esteem, and uh, she also feels these elements of uh, PTSD in her uh, present life. And Ashok comes from a British India. His family had also uh, survived, you know, oppression and famines. And Ashok's great great grandparents had traumas passed through their generations, and there are elements of poverty consciousness, so inability to create uh, abundance of wealth. There's also the suffocating kind of feeling of shame. Um, a severe anxiety and depression. So as you can see, there are different manifestations or different symptoms that uh, have, let's say, uh, behavior or mm, sensation feelings uh, on the surface of the iceberg. But below that water level, there's always some sort of uh, injustice in previous generations that are connected uh, to uh, oppression. And uh, I like what uh, the summary says. When you work on your trauma, you choose to not pass it on to the next generation. I think it's very strong. And it also helped me to work with my own trauma and work with traumas of my clients with that premise, with that mission or vision. How do I stop passing on the trauma you know, to my children, how can I stop? How can I make peace with what happened to the previous generations? And how can I change my behavior, but also below that iceberg? How can I change my longings, yearnings, my patterns huh, of behavior, not just behavior in, a, um, in separation, but it's like a behavior, pool or dynamic how can i change that now how do we inherit trauma a little bit of uh, epigenetics and a study about that what we know is around only two to three percent of our dna accounts for our physical traits and around 97 to 98 percent of our dna is considered non-coding dna which is responsible for emotional, behavioral, and personality traits and can be affected by environment. So this talk about nature and nurture, it's very important that we can actually influence how our genes are uh, expressing. So the mechanism of epigenetic inheritance, DNA methylation, methyl group is added to the DNA that suppresses gene expression. It's a very important scientific discovery. And we're still at the onset, at the beginning of understanding what it means. There's so many studies now done on 
um, on mice and also now we're starting to see also studies um, you know, with the permission done on uh, trauma survivors where we see the second, third, fourth and up to seven generations trauma passing through. And uh, that started with the research on stress, but also now we see different kinds of research and it's uh, fascinating. So for example, uh, the researcher and um, a very respected now um, scholar called Rachel Yehuda uh, wrote, it was in 2015, so almost uh, seven years ago. In studies of Holocaust survivor offspring, parental trauma occurred years before conception, suggesting that effects in offspring might be due to, in part to some biological change in gametes. A number of studies also observe effects in offspring associated with maternal stress during pregnancy. Stress effects uh, that are inherited via a transgenerational, intergenerational transmission mode are reflected in offspring biological changes, including neuroendocrine, epigenetic, and neuroanatomical changes. What a powerful statement. I wanted to share that with you. And also the picture that shows that in utero, a pregnant woman carries the information and also genetic coding material uh, through these gametes of three generations, okay? So as you can see, the genetics environment, parenting, social learning, also biological correlates, new, uh, neuroendocrine, epigenetic, neuroanatomical, you know, the stress effects in subsequent generations, they have the, uh, the root cause it could be three generations before. So our grandmother, when she was pregnant with our mother, already influenced our behavior and uh, personality traits based on the circumstances that she lived in her life and her reaction to those circumstances, whether she experienced trauma, whether she experienced some triumphs and some successes, some amazing emotions, and also some negative emotions. So whatever she experienced influenced the way how uh, our mother was in her uh, of womb, but also our mother had those precursors, those cells that had the precursors for her eggs that uh, produced us. And that is a three generational uh, memory transmission. So we sometimes uh, live and behave in response to something that our grandmother lived. I mean, how mine blown is that for me when i first found this uh fact i was like wow you know i'd love to know more about it and how does that uh, impact my life what can i do to make a difference and wow i'd love to know more about my grandmother's life <laughs> because that made a difference in the way how i treat myself and also how i respect some of those uh, circumstances and her reactions and have more compassion and empathy towards my own reactions. Now, of course, there's a lot of research and authors. So if you're interested, I just put the slide here in front of you. I particularly like Rachel Yehuda. She's a professor of psychiatry and neuroscience and vice chair for veteran affairs in the psychiatry department uh, in the USA. And she has a PhD uh, uh, sort of scientific background and she writes a lot of research uh, does research, uh, articles about the research on uh, transgenerational trauma. I respect uh, Vessel van der Kolk and his book The Body Keeps the Score I particularly like. He is a doctor, psychiatrist, author and research at Boston. Uh, Virginia Satir is a big uh, mentor of mine and uh, as I said the mother of systemic family therapy and her books, The New People Making or The Satire Model, I highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about how families function or dysfunction and what we can do to uh, overcome those. Dr. Gabo Mate, he is uh, also a big proponent of 
uh, PTSD work and transgenerational trauma. Uh, he's interested in stress, trauma, and addictions, and particularly the addictions world is something that he's famous and his work is famous. Um, and he writes and speaks uh, very interesting, very different to how we uh, normally see presenters who are very positive sort of oriented. He's just uh, himself in the way he presents, and that is very unique. And uh, uh, he has done some uh, some work uh, also to put it in a film and documentary, so you can Google it. If you haven't heard of him, I recommend you find a little bit more about his work. Bert Hellinger is, is a big um, uh, figure in the world of a phenomenological psychology and the trauma work. He has created a field called Family Systemic Constellations, um, also was inspired by Virginia Satir and her work with uh, families and family reconstructions. He did some uh, gestalt work and also he worked with the as a priest in Africa with the Zulu tribes. And he uh, was fascinated by how the uh, Zulu uh, people respected their ancestors and the work they did to honor uh, the patterns and the trauma uh, when there was some sort of illness challenge in a person's individual family life. But you know, they took the systemic approach, the family approach, and that was very interesting how uh, he um, then put it into his work. And there are thousands of people who practice systemic constellations these days across different countries. And a big proponent of his work called Mark Wallen, he wrote a book called It Didn't Start With You, uh, which is uh, uh, very easily read and quite a, a powerful read, I would say, if you're interested in this topic. Richard Schwartz, another uh, interesting uh, writer, research and uh, PhD holder, he created the field called Internal Family Systems. Uh, uh, Richard also worked uh, with, got inspired by Virginia, Virginia Satir's work with um, Parts Party. It's called Parts Party. It's the party of our internal parts. And Dr. Schwartz works um, and created this IFS uh, field that also um, family systems work uh, is now connected to IFS. Now they do a lot of research in terms of the transgenerational trauma and how we can work with our inner parts to heal. Deb Dana and Stephen Porge. So Stephen Porge, uh, Porge is, he is the creator of the polyvagal theory. Um, Deb Dana took that polyvagal theory and applied in the therapy world and her book also is quite uh, uh, interesting in the way how uh, we can understand the way we, we are functioning and how transgenerational trauma um, affects our behavior in terms of nervous system and what we can do to suppress, also activate and deactivate different uh, parts of our vagus nerve and the, the system that controls our nerves, meaning emotions and sensations, and what we can do when we're disconnected, or how can we connect uh, by uh, working with parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Very interesting piece of work. If you're um, interested in, in that, it's something you can look into. And Peter Levine, uh, he is the creator and author of Somatic Experiencing. Uh, Dr. Levine, does a lot of work with trauma also. He, uh, he has a very, very interesting sort of association and also parallels with the animal world, the animal kingdom. So for example, animals who experience trauma and it happens very often, they shake off that stress and they go into tremor and then you know they feel functional again. So there's an interesting connection with the uh, the body work uh, that he does. And there's also a sensory motor work uh, with Pat Ogden. And, and I will share with you my uh, piece of work that I've created called Stasis Kinesis, which is also based on the soma therapy, but also has elements of uh, cognitive and behavioral therapy, as well as some other research and evidence-based tools. And of course, is grounded in the systems 
theory and the satire model, which has all sorts of elements in it, behavioral, evolutionary, person-centered, and interpersonal, uh, uh, and uh, humanistic, <laughs> and experiential, you name it. I think it's a beautiful and elegant, holistic model um, that uh, was, in a way, ahead of her time. Virginia was ahead of her time. Now we know a lot more with the research, how it happens and why. Now, uh, if we have some time, if you have some time, I highly recommend you listen. I would like to share with you um, an uh, audio, actually part of the audio book called Breaking the Chains of Transgenerational Trauma, My Journey from Surviving to Thriving by Dorothy Hudson. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist. And it's a very new and recent book that has some interesting insights and correlation with, say, uh, connection with the attachment theory, but also gives you a little insight into this world of transgenerational trauma. And I found it very useful. And I thought, I would love to share it with you. I know now that you're here and you have dedicated your time to learn about yourself, maybe help yourself and others. So I invite you to listen uh, to this um, piece. It's quite a lengthy piece, so uh, maybe around 20 minutes. If you have uh, uh, time, I highly recommend you listen to it. Um, and if you- Nailed it so oh, fast. Uh, I also have a link. So if you want to just listen on YouTube, you can just follow that link, but here, hopefully you can hear um, as I switch it on. Hello friends, this is Dorothy Hewson, and I'm gonna be reading from my book, Breaking the Chains of Transgenerational Trauma, My Journey from Surviving to Thriving. And today I'm gonna to be reading chapter five, Lost Connection. When parents are consistently unable to attune to their child, the bond or connection between parent and child can develop in ways that make it difficult for the child to be resilient and manage traumas. Because our very survival as infants depends on our parent or primary caregiver, that relationship makes a huge impression on us. So the quality of it is important. It lays the groundwork for what we expect from and how we behave in other relationships, including and most especially in our relationship with ourselves. In psychology, the bond or connection between two people is known as attachment. British psychoanalyst John Bowlby coined the term while studying aspects of the mother-child bond on human development. Developmental psychologist Mary Ainsworth, who studied under Bowlby, built on his attachment theory and defined three attachment styles, secure, avoidant, and anxious. Later, psychologist Mary Main, who studied under Mary Ainsworth, and Judith Solomon would add a fourth, disorganized. Your attachment style was created in your first three years of life when you were pre-verbal. It was formed when you felt scared or stressed and had to figure out how to stay in the closest proximity possible to your primary caregiver to relieve that stress. Secure, avoidant, anxious, disorganized. A secure attachment pattern is created when an infant is cared for by an attentive parent who is reliable and emotionally available. These children learn they can trust in other people and the world. Securely attached babies tend to grow into adults with the self-love and confidence needed to engage in healthy relationships, as well as navigate disappointment and tragedy. An avoidant attachment pattern occurs when a child's primary caregiver is consistently unavailable emotionally. Such children resort to suppressing their feelings. They idealize their parents and their childhoods. They often describe their upbringing in vague terms like great and can't complain. Not surprisingly, 
they grow into highly independent adults with big trust issues when it comes to people and the world in general. Yet, they're conflicted. They feel intense loneliness, but are never fully able to invest themselves in relationships. The anxious, anxious attachment pattern results from parents being inconsistent with care or very conditional with their love. These children blame themselves when their parents are neglectful. They take it upon themselves to win back their parents' love and attention. These children grow up with self-esteem issues. They go into adult relationships with a great need for love and a greater fear of abandonment. When negative things happen in their lives, they head straight to self-blame where they don't usually find a healthy solution or resilience. The disorganized attachment pattern typically results from extreme trauma, abuse, and or abandonment by parents or primary caregiver. All children are born with a strong drive to connect with their caregiver. So when a caregiver becomes a threat to a child's survival, it confuses the child's brain. This can result in a disorganized attachment pattern. For these children, relationships become triggers, causing them to dissociate and go into fight, flight, freeze, or faint. They can become antisocial. Some fail to develop empathy and grow up to be abusers themselves. These are not strict categories. We tend to word one pattern over another and at various intensities. Unless you're 100% securely attached, and that's rare, your attachment issues present themselves on a spectrum of skewed behaviors and subpar life management skills. Bursts of anger, addiction, immaturity, inability to maintain relationships, inability to leave harmful relationships, and a susceptibility to post-traumatic stress disorder are all clues that an attachment pattern needs healing. If left unattended, these damaging behaviors follow us through childhood into our romantic relationships, and finally, into our relationship with our children, affecting the quality of their attachment. A case in point, my dad. Unlike mom, dad barely talked at all. He never spoke about his childhood ever, and I rarely asked. But one evening when I was about 10, I was sitting in our living room where he was eating his dinner. As he watched TV, I watched him. In a matter of minutes, he gobbled down a plate piled high with rice, squash, pork, and kimchi. He inhaled it so fast, I wondered how he could eat like that without choking. So without thinking, I asked, Dad, why do you eat so fast? He looked at me for a full 10 seconds. Then he smiled and answered, well, when I lived in the orphanage, all the children would sit in a circle. The food was placed in the middle in big communal bowls. We all had to eat from the bowls. So whoever ate fastest got to eat more food. Though I've thought about his answer so many times as an adult, I didn't give it much thought back then. I was probably astounded that he answered it all. My dad was born in Hawaii, the fourth child of immigrant parents from Okinawa, Japan. His father was an alcoholic who spent all his money on booze and came and went as he pleased. His mother had been a mail order bride. They had four children, Seiko, B. Seo and my dad, Satan. After my dad was born, his father deserted the family for good, leaving them penniless. His mother had a severe mental breakdown and was put in an asylum. Only five years old with no one to care for him, my father was packed off to an orphanage without his siblings. Five years later, as soon as his brother Seiko was old enough, he got my dad out of the orphanage and raised him. I only know these few details about my dad's family because my mother told me, and she only knew because my dad's siblings told her. In fact, in Germany, 
My dad told my mom that his mother was dead. Then after my parents had been in Hawaii a few years, one night his brother Seo casually mentioned he was going to go visit their mother. What? She's alive? My mother asked. I'm coming with you. If my mom was upset that her husband had lied to her for years, she never made that a part of her story. My mom said when she and Seo entered my grandmother's room at the psychiatric hospital, my grandmother didn't acknowledge them. She sat silent and dull-eyed, staring forward. My mother described her as a porcelain geisha doll, locked inside herself, a shell of a person, physically alive, but mentally dead. Like his mother, my dad's silence kept him locked inside himself too. When I was 15, dad had a complete psychotic break. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and hospitalized for months. When he came home from the hospital, he had great difficulty with verbal utterances. Without warning, a guttural sound would rumble through his body and pop out of his mouth. Shocked and embarrassed by the noise, he'd jump up, cover his mouth, and run to his room. Still, I could hear him behind his closed door, trying to stifle these unwanted and uncontrollable utterances. Of course, neither he nor my mother explained what was going on to us children. Medically, he was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. His utterances were deemed a tick, an involuntary repetitive vocalization or movement. But energetically, maybe even spiritually, I think it was my father's voice, tired of suppression and struggling to be heard. It would be a year before my dad was able to return to work, but he did return. Healing is on a spectrum too. My dad likely had a disorganized attachment pattern. The trauma and abandonment of his early years left him unable to form and participate in healthy relationships. But unlike his own father and mother, my dad didn't allow his inability to connect to completely devoid the relationships that he did have. Perhaps his brother having rescued him and given him a home provided my dad with a little more security than either of his parents had known. Though he was unable to attune or even really talk to any of us, my dad got up every morning at the crack of dawn and drove to McDonnell Douglas in Torrance, where he worked as a maintenance electrician. He arrived home every evening like clockwork, then ate his dinner, worked in his garden, watched TV, and went to bed. In other words, my dad provided, he didn't abandon. His kids would never end up in an orphanage as he did. He even took my mother back and made the family whole again after she divorced him. It would take me years in therapy to appreciate what a mighty struggle this, might have, this must have been for him and to acknowledge his success. I'm sure the routine of work and his strict regimen after work provided needed structure to his disorganized mind. His quietness and self-isolation also helped keep him calm. And as so many with insecure attachment patterns do, as every member of my family eventually did, for better and worse, he created his own secure relationship with Jesus, a relationship with lots of rules and rituals to contain it, a relationship he would become more and more dependent on as he aged. As long as I can remember, I always felt slightly afraid of my dad. He never hit me or yelled at me, but he never hugged me either or kissed me on the forehead like TV dads do. Still, I felt loved by him. He always changed the oil in my car and made sure my tires had enough pressure. When I broke down on the freeway, I called him for help because I knew he'd drop everything and come right away. When I needed money for college, dad gave it to me, not mom. I knew I could count on him in any situation. While he may never have won the parent of the year award, 
His actions demonstrate an attempt at creating a positive attachment between us. Once my dad retired at age 77, his Alzheimer's disease progressed quickly. In my whole life, my, the only emotion I ever witnessed my dad express was anger, mostly at mom, but also at my brothers. Yet once the Alzheimer's had taken hold, he became kind. When I visited him at his care facility, he'd smile, something I'd rarely seen him do. And sometimes he'd say, I know I've done something bad, but I can't remember what I've done. I'm sorry. Then he'd cry. It was heartbreaking. Yet oddly, that vulnerability made him accessible to me. I had empathy for him and felt a connection to him. I like to believe that the smiling man is who my dad really was and would have become before life's traumas shaped him. He died at the age of 85. As sad as it is to think about, I now understand why he never said the words, I love you, to me or anyone. His bridge of connection to the world and to other human beings was missing. He couldn't trust his inner guide, so he structured his life through routines and religion and built the best attachments he could. Transgenerational brokenness. My dad's attachment pattern did affect me. Temperamentally, I was quiet like him. I retreated from life and I struggled to form relationships. Though unlike my dad, I very consciously craved them. When I was too quiet, which was often, my mother would complain. You're just like your dad. You don't say anything. She was right. But it would be my mother and her own attachment issues that would have more influence on my attachment pattern. She was, after all, my primary caregiver, the person I looked to for survival. From her stories, I know that she and her mother were close. I also know that her mother made the rules and ran the show. No questions asked. My mom didn't make a decision for herself. My grandmother made them. Perhaps that's because it's the only way my grandmother knew to maintain order in a home with nine children and an emotionally distant father. Like her mother, my mom also married an emotionally distant man under duress. A relationship pattern I continued minus the duress part. She too parented as a total dictator, never to be questioned. This was especially true when it came to me, her constant companion. She directed my every move. She told me what I liked and what I didn't, what to do and how to do it. She set the expectations for my life and I tried to oblige. I often felt I fell short and she allowed me to feel that way. All that combined with her volatile temper kept me on my toes as a child. One minute she was delighting in having me by her side. The next she'd explode in anger just because she didn't like what I was wearing, which in all probability she picked out. As a child, I was never sure which mom I was going to get. I was never sure if I was going to please her or make her mad. So I was constantly monitoring her moods, figuring out what to do, trying to manage everything and everyone in the house. There was no room to develop a sense of self, but what did develop was an anxious attachment pattern. I had a deep need to be accepted and a palpable fear of making a mistake. This made it very difficult for me to be in a relationship, even friendships. I'd watch the pretty girls talking and laughing with each other. I wished so hard I could join them, but then, when they'd invite me over, I'd become so self-conscious that I'd make an excuse and decline their invitation. When the neighborhood kids gathered casually to play a pickup game or hang out, I never went. Years later in therapy, when I looked at this behavior pattern closely, I learned what prevented me from joining in with other kids. I didn't know who to be. More to the point, I didn't know who they wanted me to be. If they could have just let me know I could have become that person. I did it for my mom all the time, but to show up as myself, I was at a loss. I didn't know who that was. 
After I was sexually assaulted, my anxious attachment style ensured I would put my mother's feelings before my own because I had no need to consider. Instead of crying and clinging to her as a normal six-year-old might, I fell into my pattern and did what I thought would make her comfortable. I stayed quiet and compliant. I did what I was told, keeping my questions, my feelings, my terror tucked deep inside resulted in post-traumatic stress disorder. It also laid the groundwork for the two subsequent assaults to occur. Transgenerational healing. I live my life in my head with my own doubts and fears, with my longings and fantasies constantly swirling around and never being expressed, just like my dad. Also like my dad, I eventually found a workaround for a relationship, so at least I appeared normal. I too formed relationships through doing. As a teenager, I played on the tennis team and was active in my church. In college, I went to parties and drank. When I got older, I got more into church, specifically women's Bible studies. But I never made real friends. I had put up walls of protection that I was unaware of. I think to really connect with someone, you need to feel securely attached within yourself. You need to feel comfortable being yourself. I was neither. When I tried to connect and make friends, my discomfort would cause both me and the other person to move away from each other. But once in therapy, I started to learn the value of putting myself first which demanded that I come to know a me to put first. That meant repairing my attachment style, which gave me the tools and support to connect to the real me. Securely attached parents naturally behave in ways with their children that transfer their inner security without consciously thinking about it. In their own individual ways, my father and mother did all they knew to do to keep us safe and give us the best life. Yet no deed my father could have done or rule my mother could have made would have kept me safe from that first assault. A more secure attachment pattern, however, would have seen us all through the initial trauma and saved me from post-traumatic stress disorder. Secure attachment was not a life skill my parents had to give. So I would eventually have to develop it, develop it for myself with the added incentive of being able to model it for my own children. The exercise at the end of chapter five is called the body scan. Children learn how to feel their feelings through a psychological process called reflection. That's when parents reflect back to the child what they're feeling by validating the child's feelings. For example, when I felt happy baking cookies with my mom, she'd smile at me and say, I can see you're really enjoying baking cookies with me. I learned what happiness felt like in my body. When it comes to more difficult emotions, the ones people don't like to talk about, we as children don't get as much reflection. So we often become detached from how those emotions feel in our bodies. An exercise called the body scan can help us reattach to those emotions and ourselves. In this exercise, you reflect back to yourself what you're feeling by becoming familiar with the sensations in your body. You'll need about 30 minutes to be alone in a place where you can sit in silence. Step one, sit in a chair with your feet flat on the floor, your hands on your knees. Close your eyes and feel your breathing for two or three minutes. Step two, feel your body fill up and expand when you inhale. Feel your body relax, settle down, and release your breath when you exhale. Step three, after a couple of minutes, you will become aware of what's going on inside of your body and are ready to scan. Step four. Start with your feet. Look for sensations such as the contact points at the bottom of your feet to the ground. 
Do you feel the contact points where your shoes touch your feet, the pressure points? Do your feet feel hot, warm, or cold? Do your feet feel sweaty? Do your feet feel stiff? Do your feet feel any tightness or pain? Do you feel any energy or electricity shocks in your feet? Can you feel any tingling or movement inside of your feet? Perhaps pulsing, twitching, or itching? Your goal is to sit with and notice any and all sensations that arise from your body. Step five, move up to your lower legs and ask those same questions. What sensations do you feel in your lower legs? Step six, move your attention into your upper legs and ask the same questions. Step seven, Keep moving your attention slowly up your body into your abdomen, chest, back, arms, neck, shoulders, and head. Take your time. Notice the sensations by observing and investigating. Receive information about your body by feeling the sensations that arise. As this becomes a regular practice, You'll become more and more comfortable with your body and your feelings. You'll come to accept yourself, all of you. Well, this concludes the reading of chapter five of my book and the exercise, the body scan. Thank you. Okay. Let me just uh, switch to the other. Green. Oh, where is that? Where did we? Hmm. Here we go. So, hopefully, you found it uh, helpful. And also, there was an exercise. I invite you to to do it. Don't do it while you're driving, but um, if you can sit comfortably, it's always good to. Um, to have that connection, I would like to offer you also an alternative method called Enrich Method and how we work in our retreats and workshops with transgenerational trauma. Um, and I've created this method based on the work of Virginia Satir, but also uh, my professional practice as a psychologist. So what is the Enrich Method? It's a combination of neuroscience, communication and body work. And in the middle, there is this enrich. Enrich stands for explore, nourish, respond, imagine, communicate, and hugs and humor. So when we look into the each of this concept, they connected to our uh, hormones inside our body. And uh, it's all about rebalancing that hormonal cocktail. Uh, if we look at the evolutionary or medical or biological perspective, because the way how we deal with stress, we can always see in the tests and, and hormones how they also affected um, by that epigenetic um, uh, expression of our genes and you know what I like to um, to see is that we have you know this holistic way of uh, rebalancing all parts of our life you know exploring and nourishing exploring is all about dopamine and nourishing is all about serotonin respond is about cortisol level imagine about endorphins communicate is about estrogen and hugs about oxytocin so these are important hormones also in the way how we can heal ourselves when it comes to the transgenerational trauma now of course if we look at explore explore is through the lens of intergenerational patterns i invite you to look into some of the patterns that traveled through your um, family generations and see ones that you would like to keep because some of them are very helpful but also see the ones that you don't like or maybe they are preventing you from living a, a thriving life or fulfilling life a passionate life 
And as you choose some of those patterns that travel, you know, sometimes seven generations, actually in uh, uh, different languages, for example, in Russian, the word family, семья, means seven eyes. So seven different eye, you know, identities that, you know, like a matryoshka, that Russian doll uh, uncovers itself again and again and again, and it travels through the seven sort of cycles and um, Ayurveda or Vedic, um, uh, traditions there's also a number seven 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 days in the week seven uh, years uh, that sort of we rejuvenate our body and our cells but um i find it very interesting and curious when there's a different uh, uh interesting patterns like that that travel so as you explore and you find that, I invite you to nourish yourself, not necessarily just by eating healthy foods, but also by imagining your grandparents and imagining your parents behind you. So um, if you feel comfortable now to close your eyes and to sit uh, with your spine straight, with your feet flat on the ground or the floor, and your palms open, sort of palms up. And as you uh, feel your breathing and you take a few deep breaths and you close your eyes and you close your eyes again, it's okay if you feel safe. And as you tune in with your breathing, I would like to guide you through this nourishing exercise about connecting to the core uh, that love that traveled for generations. Many generations before you happened for you to be alive. They connected, they made love for you to be born. And feeling that gratitude just for the, for the sake of being alive, for the life force traveling through those generations, as you imagine them behind you, you can turn, imagine you can turn yourself and you see that like a peacock tail, tail like a pizza size, like a sort of the system behind you with uh, multiple generations of your ancestors. And as you imagine them, I would like you to feel the gratitude and thank them for giving you an opportunity to be born in this life. That little exercise as you feel the power of your clan, of your family, of your ancestral um, blueprint with all that it comes with. Sometimes it comes with you know, the negative, but also comes with positive. When we gather and count our blessings, we feel more resourceful. We feel more resilient and we peel that onion and we get to the core of what matters and we connect and nourish and validate ourselves on that transgenerational level. I start a lot of my practices with this, when work with clients and workshops and retreats and it's a beautiful nourishing exercise. So, Explore, nourish, now respond, and reaches R, and R stands for respond versus react. When we respond mindfully, we, uh, we can meditate, we can uh, use our um, self-awareness to manage stress. Uh, here, a lot of the time, I share uh, in our retreats and practices a practice that I created called stasis kinesis and it's a great little powerful activity that I would like to share now with you that uh, connects through the work of Virginia Satir with different stances or stress stances communication stances and uh, she talked about four of them and then Sharon Lushen added the fifth one so the first one is called the blamer when we blame somebody or something for what happened to us right and um, it's a physical stance normally we do it with our body and you can just experiment a little bit just as you see or i invite you to stand if you feel comfortable and point and imagine somebody or something 
in front of you that you're either angry about or are irritated about, and it's just the blaming stance. Okay, uh, the next one is called placator. It's the opposite of blamer. It's generally a, a stance where you feel the other person is knows uh, better. They you know, they are right and you are wrong. You say, oh, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It's my fault. It's that low self-worth kind of position of I am little, you are big. Um, a third one is called super reasonable or computer when this person is very much uh, detached from their feelings and emotions. And they're just sharing facts, figures, uh, people in you know, legal profession or engineers, generally business people, men, they like to use that super reasonable stance a lot in their life. Uh, and the fourth one is called distracting or irrelevant stance is like a person who has three hands. It's sort of like, um, you know, when you want to talk about difficult pieces uh, or difficult subject, they... Uh, they don't like that. So they go like, "Oh, how about the weather? Let's let's just have a cup of tea," um, you know. And they distract. They change topic. And the fifth one is called withdrawal, when the person turns away from the world of problems and shuts down, doesn't talk. So these five stress stances, they're quite interesting because these are reactive stances that we learn from our family of origin. And uh, we experience them in this primal triad, a parent, generally it's a mother, parent two, generally it's a father, but it can be also same gender. But, you know, we experience this as a child. So when our parents have the stress and how do they communicate? Or how did they communicate with each other using these five uh, fundamental uh, communication stress uh, stances. Now, if a parent was absent or uh, I work with orphans and orphanages uh, and this work is very, very strong and effective, I invite to, uh, to assume that when a parent is absent, it's, an, it's a withdrawal stance. It's like they're running away or they just shut down and they're invisible. It's an extreme version of disconnection when people uh, give their children for adoption or um, they, they uh, separate and move away from their children. Now, the opposite of the stress stances are flow stances. So with the, um, what I've done is added to the dysfunctional ones, for example, the blamer, a peaceful warrior, a stance that has a similar dynamic stress hormone is testosterone and we uh, raise hand and look up and it becomes like a yoga pose um, and it counterbalances that stress into flow and from that flow we can come to our congruent stance which is a uh, a neutral stance that we want but it's uh, in many cases very hard to do uh, especially when it comes to transgenerational trauma. So what we do is we use the stances to experiment with our body. For example, when we uh, know the placata, if we, if we do a lot of placating in our life and saying, oh, I'm so sorry, please forgive me, this is not my fault. The opposite is the power tree or powerful tree. When we raise our hand and we stay strong, it's also kind of a yoga pose. With you can lift your foot, your uh, leg, uh, one of those, and spread your arms. And feel how it feels because it is a somatic body work. And as we change our posture and we change the way we stand, we also change the way we feel and the way we behave. So as we practice these poses or these dances, stasis, kinesis in Greek, stasis means stance, kinesis means movement or dance. So it is a little dance of our stress response, right? Stress from reactivity to responding. And we train our neural system. I would train our body how to move from dysfunction to function and so on. So for example, the third one, super reasonable, yes, turns into humble monk, humble monk. 
distracting or irrelevant turns into a core harmonizer. And withdrawal turns into a world hugger. So we practice these dances with people in triads. And what do we notice? That there is certain longing, the needs um, that govern these stances are very similar. But if we move from stress to flow, we satisfy these needs. But we change the behavior from fighting and blaming to you know, becoming a peaceful warrior. And this hormone testosterone is still activated, but it's in a different kind of quality. In a placata, the needs are for love and care, stability and strength. Behavior is very sort of like beggy, begging, placating, hormone estrogen. But when we're in power treat pose, we have that need met. And it's a much more functional pose. Super so reasonable, the humble monk. The behavior is about criticism, monologue. Is the, uh, the need is for understanding, for acceptance, for wisdom. The hormone serotonin. So when we turn into a humble monk, we also, you know, uh, balance in that ego, and our body also becomes a bit more flexible, a bit more uh, forward looking. Distractor. Uh, adding chaos and distracting. The need is for harmony, stability, and courage, the hormone dopamine. The withdrawal uh, is about moving away. The need is to be, uh, to, to trust, to be touched, to open up the hormone oxytocin. When we hug, we have a lot of oxytocin going on. And uh, if we move to the hugs, why uh, uh, hugs is so important because it's connected to the touch and the touch is well, uh, hap haptics. It's a, it's a huge uh, interesting field that's now um, on the rise in interest. And why? Because we have something in our um, tactile receptors in the skin that is very, very interesting, especially I'm curious about, you know, Pacinian corpuscle, that's part of our skin that's reacting when we hug, when we touch our ourselves, our body, when we hug ourselves or we hug another person, and this has a healing property. So something as simple as hug can actually help us heal. Uh, and okay, it's a long process to heal transgenerational trauma. We do a lot of uh, family reconstruction work and family constellation work during our uh, webinars, our workshops online and uh, retreats. And, uh, but you can also do it by looking and exploring and doing you know, this practice of stasis kinesis. If you watch the recording again and again, you will practice these dances. And if you hug, if you learn this art of uh, haptic communication of hugs, so hopefully your oxytocin will rise and you will feel much better by doing that meditative exercise with validation, you can nourish yourself. So we touched a little bit of, on exploration, on nourishment, on response, how to respond versus react uh, in stasis kinesis mode. Imagine positive things and imagining your family from that um, perspective of support system, like the you know the army behind you that supports you, whatever you do. You know, if you fall flat, you stand up. They are behind you. They are there to support invisibly. Communication, the art of communication, also through stasis kinesis, you can practice, and the art of hugs. So all these hormones, hopefully you will rebalance and feel better. Your cocktail of emotions and your cocktail of hormones inside your body will feel uh, better and you will hopefully heal yourself backwards and forwards by stopping that pattern that you don't want to give to the future generations, but even just working on yourself. So if you have any questions, comments, I'd love to hear from you. Find me on Instagram uh, at the.family.psychologist account on Facebook, Daria Haitoglu International page, or write to info at dariahaitoglu.com is my website, dariahaitoglu.com, if you want to find out more about how you can heal your transgenerational trauma. Thank you very much, and all the best to you all.